Our first reading today is taken from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chooses us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Would you rise with a reading of our gospel? Taken from Luke 2, verses 40 through 52. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Every year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, he went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking that he was in their company, they traveled for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, "'Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you.' "'Why were you searching for me?' he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his measure treasured, his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. Happy New Year. It is good to be with you. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if many of you do this or not, but I know that there are lots of people 
who use the occasion of the passing of the old and the coming of the new to set about this business of writing out some things that they want to do better in the coming year. Some of the things that people have over the years shared with me that they wanted to do, they want to read more books. They want to get more uh, involved in a hobby or a sport, um, learn a new skill, eat better, cut out some sweets, et cetera, et cetera. But I doubt that any of you put on your list this year to grow in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with man. And yet that's kind of what we see happening here with Jesus is that's the tagline at the end of the passage that Pastor Steve just read, that Jesus grew in stature, in wisdom and stature and favor, not only with God, but with man. And so my hope today is that we can talk a little bit about how could that actually happen and I think some of the clues are in the text. And so we're just going to kind of wander through the text and stop on some phrases along the way and pick some things out. And in the end, I hope what will happen is that you'll have a sense of how you can grow in wisdom and stature and favor. One of the first phrases that jumped off the page to me as I was reading this was, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem every year. Now that might seem like no big deal to you and I. I mean, we just hop in our cars and we go to church and it's just what we do and we spend 15 minutes or whatever the timeline is to get here. But that wasn't the way it was for Mary and Joseph and Jesus. They lived in Nazareth, which is up here, and they would go to Jerusalem, which is down here, and that's 65 miles as the crow flies. So just think of yourself as being at this place here and draw a radius out 65 miles and make a circle, and you get to places like west of Weatherford, south of Hillsboro, east of Terrell, almost up to Gainesville, and you don't have a car. You're walking. And every year, on the day of the Passover, this herd of people would come up from Nazareth, and they would make their way to Jerusalem, and they would do this because this was one of the three big festivals that every year people were at, expected to travel for. There were more, but the three biggies of Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, people kind of were like expected to go. And as Pastor Steve shared with us last week, Jesus' uh, family was not a family of means. They were poor. They offered the very smallest offering at Jesus' dedication and circumcision that they could. And I don't know if, how it, it goes for you all, but for me, when we travel, it kind of takes a bite out of the pocketbook. You've got meals on the road, and you've got transportation costs, and lodging, and all of these things. And so for this brood of people to travel up from Nazareth and actually from all over Israel and they would make this trip every year it was a big investment why would they do it <coughs> my watch is telling me she didn't know what I said so thank you <laughs> um, where was I yes so thank you Family was poor, and it was a big investment. So why would they go? Why would they go? Well, they would go because they were participating in the story of God. In the Hebrew, um, the word for remember, God commands his people to remember the Passover on an annual basis. And he says, he says go and do this every year. Remember, commemorate, remember. But the word is zakor. And the word zakor means more than just a cognitively going back and thinking about those events. It actually means that you're participating in the event. See, as they made their pilgrimage from Nazareth to Jerusalem, it was much like they were remembering, they were participating in the journey up from Egypt back to the promised land. They were participating in this journey. 
That's kind of what I'm hoping you might catch today. We are participating in the journey of an active and alive God who's never stopped acting in history. We don't come here together just to do religious education stuff. Boring. We come here because there's a God who lives and he still has a fingerprint on the world today. And he has a holy people that he's calling out to journey with him on an amazing salvation journey that never stops until the day Jesus comes back. And that's what Mary and Joseph, that's why they would invest the time and the energy of taking not only Jesus, but he had probably some siblings by this point, and that whole brood of leading them up here to Jerusalem three or four days each way, stay there for a few days, is a big deal. They would invest. Another phrase that caught my eye as we went along was that in chapter 2, verse 42, it says, when he was 12 years old, that started me down this path of thinking about milestones in life. And you know, about 12 is a big time of kind of amped up education in the church then and in the church now. Back in the day, on the, the Sunday after you turned 13, you would have your bar mitzvah. And a bar mitzvah meant you were a son of the commandment, a son of the law. That's what mitzvah means. It means commandment or law. You are now responsible for yourself under the law. See, up until that point, your, your sins came upon your father. If you did something wrong and there was restitution that had to be paid to a neighbor, you broke their window with the baseball, guess who paid it? Daddy, up until 12. But at 13, you were responsible to pay your debts before God and your neighbor. This was a coming of age moment. And Jesus was hungry to learn. And Jesus was in, <clears throat> in the synagogue. He was in the temple learning and teaching. And this whole business of a season of amped up education is something that I think we can still learn about today. You know, there is a certain curiosity that happens in a child at about this age where um, if you'll, in modern behavior, here's how you would observe it. You would observe conquering the levels of the video game. That's what 12-year-olds do now. In that day, it was probably similar. They're, they're wired to learn new things, how to conquer, how to overcome, how to understand, how to grasp. That's what's happening in the life of a burgeoning preteen adolescent. And Jesus was just a boy. And yet so much more than that. We see that in the reaction that we get a little bit later, and I'll come to that. In verse 43, we see that Jesus stayed behind. This is not that Jesus just kind of accidentally forgot to go. It wasn't that he was running away from home. It wasn't that he didn't want to be with his parents. Jesus intentionally stayed behind. He was compelled by something. He was caught up in a story that was bigger than himself. Verse 44 goes on. It says, they traveled for about a day. Now, time out. The world is a really different place, isn't it? Think about this for just a second. It was a day before they realized he was gone. It took them another day to get back, and on the third day they finally found him. What would be happening today within moments of somebody knowing that their child is gone? Amber alerts? Probably arrest warrants for uh, being delinquent parents and not keeping a closer eye on your kiddos. I remember it wasn't that long ago when I was a kid. Now that is relative, right? 50 years ago or whatever. I would get on my bike. This was probably starting with probably seven, age seven or eight maybe. I'd get on my bike. I'd ride down to my buddy's house down at the bottom of the street. 
the Fitzgeralds, and I'd stay there through lunch. I just had to call my mom and check in. And then I'd go over to my other friend, Jay Kern's house, and I would eat dinner there, and then they'd ask me if I wanted to spend the night. And I'd be gone for days. They didn't really know. They didn't really care what I was doing. They trusted, right? That's a little bit more like the environment that Jesus was in at this point. There was this whole group of people. They'd traveled up from Nazareth together, family and friends, and they'd gone to celebrate this most high and holy day where they remembered God's saving act of delivering his people up out of Egypt and setting them free from slavery. And they were participating in this journey together, and it was more like a family reunion. And they kind of just expected, well, everybody else is going. He should know to come along. He's 12. He's almost an adult. But no, he didn't. It's an interesting thing as you think about this just for a second. How did we get this story? Or how did we get some of the stories that are in Scripture that are like, how did, for example, Gabriel and the Annunciation to Mary... Who reported that? How did Luke know to write that? Well, most commentators and most biblical scholars would say it had to come through Mary at some point, right? Because there was only two people there, Gabriel and Mary. And so Mary had to have shared that story, but a lot of people believe that Luke actually sat down and interviewed Mary and got a chance to understand this. Remember, At the start of Luke's gospel, here's what he says. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the events that have been fulfilled among us. Just as those who are eyewitnesses from the beginning and ministers of the word have handed them down to us. So he's saying eyewitnesses handed things down to us. And I have decided after carefully investigating accurately writing anew to write down for you an orderly sequence, dear Theophilus, that you may realize with certainty the words that you have received. So he deeply investigated all the stories, all of the pieces of the narrative that he was going to put into his gospel. Oh, (coughs) excuse me. Why do I bother to, to go down that track at all? Because I think Mary is kind of self-reporting her parent to be neglect here. (laughs) Mary is the one who's reporting this to Luke. She's saying, this is kind of what happened. We were on the journey. We realized a whole day later, he wasn't there. Uh Uh-oh, better go back. We're going to dig all the way back through Jerusalem and probably find him at a kickball game or something. No, where was Jesus? The temple. Now, if you're going to find your kid after three days, there's probably not a better place to find them, right? The temple? Not a bad place to be. But remember what Mary's reaction was? She says she was anxious. Son, why have you treated us this way? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. She had a real visceral reaction, like the mom whose kid is hiding in the, the clothing section in Walmart in those big circular things, and she, it's a panic. It's a freak out. It's like, ah, you come unglued, you come undone. That's what happens when your child goes missing. And Mary is reporting this incident to us. But it turns out that later she comes back and she says, and she pondered these things. And she treasured these things. She held closely to these things. Oh, my son, he was over there in the temple. Huh. Interesting. Remember, she had had a number of other things to ponder along the way. The Annunciation, the angel that told him to go down to Egypt, etc., etc. And at age 12 here now, She finds herself pondering the fact that as Jesus is sitting with the best of the best, because this is Jerusalem, right? It's the hub. It's where your best theologians get together and discuss stuff. And Jesus is sitting right around in the temple courts with them, the best and the brightest. And they were what? Amazed. Now that's a fascinating word. They were amazed. Did you know that in the Bible, the word amazed is used 42 times? 
And 37 of those are in conjunction with Jesus' teaching and miracles. It's almost always all about Jesus' teaching and miracles when people are like, whoa, what did we just experience? Here are some of the synonyms for the biblical word amazed. Overwhelmed, in awe, to wonder, to admire, to marvel, to be surprised. This is what the temple leaders, the best and the brightest of the theologians of Jesus' day, were thinking about what he was saying. They were amazed. Mary's reaction and Joseph's was different. As I mentioned before, she said, Son, why have you treated us like this? We've been anxiously searching for you. And the word that gets attached to them is astonished. They were astonished. Now that can mean also amazed, but on the negative side, here is kind of what astonished means. It means perplexed, bewildered, dazed, confused, disconcerted, flustered, flummoxed. I can sense that, can't you? We're so anxious. Where the heck have you been, kid? Twelve-year-old boy was sitting with the teachers, listening and asking them questions. And then Jesus says this, Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But the text goes on to say, But they didn't understand. They didn't understand. And then it goes on to say this. It says, And then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. At first, Jesus was being obedient to his heavenly Father. And he was also being obedient to his earthly parents. But his obedience to the heavenly Father is really where I want to take you for a moment. Where does that obedience lead him? Father, if it were possible to take this cup of suffering from me, not my will, but yours, obedience led him to the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. Obedience led him to willingly place himself on the cross. That's amazing and astonishing. Jesus finds himself back in Jerusalem some 20 years later, again doing an amazing thing, laying down his life. Now, a lot of times I've heard people preach on this text, and they say, well, be like Jesus. Go and spend your time in the temple. Be like Joseph and Mary. Make sure that you're regularly gathering every year, every week, every day, Yes, I'm not against any of that. But here's what I'd really like to say. You're never really going to fully attain what you're looking for based on your effort. You can't. You're broken. But God, in his goodness, comes to us and he provides the way out. He provides one who was obedient perfectly. One who not only went to the Passover, but was the Passover. And in just a couple of minutes, we're going to have the opportunity to zakor, to participate in, to not only remember Jesus in his body and blood, but be taken back to that place where Jesus is setting his people free. This is why we say that the sacrament is the real presence of Jesus. Because we are not just mentally remembering something that happened 2,000 years ago when we participate in his body and blood. We are actively and alive participating now. The God of history is breaking the rules and he's coming among us. And he's saying, I'm giving you what you don't deserve. Grace and mercy. My obedient son, in spite of your disobedience. So if you truly want to grow in wisdom and stature and favor, I'm all in 
favor of you being in a part of a daily reading program and making sure you're regularly at church and participating in the body life of the Christ in this place. But if you really want to grow in wisdom and stature and favor, you worship the one who would be obedient even unto death. That's where this all takes root. That's where it all starts to make a difference. That's where it all comes together. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with man. And so might we as we keep our eyes locked on him who is the author and perfecter of our faith. I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer. (coughs) Father, thank you. Thank you that it's not about us and our obedience and our perfection. But you sent an unblemished lamb that his blood would be on the doorpost of our lives, that the Passover, that the angel of death would not come to us, but that we would be passed over, that we participate in that story this morning as we receive your body and blood, that we continue to participate in that story each and every day. We walk this planet with you as our Lord and leader. May we, may we keep our eyes fixed on you. May we learn to walk in your ways, and may we grow in wisdom and favor and stature. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as we speak together a word of declaration about who God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are, as recorded in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, and he descended into hell. And the third day he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.